Let's stand if you're able, and we'll read through Colossians chapter 4, and then I'm going to do my best to share some of the things that God's given me. Starting at verse 1, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Tychicus will give you a full report about how I am getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. I am also sending Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas's cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Jesus, the one we call Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God. And, that a, a, and what a comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Aeropolis. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings and so does Demas. Please give me greetings. uh, Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. After you have read this letter, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so that they can read it too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them. And say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Here's my greeting in my own handwriting. Paul, remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. You may be seated. When Pastor finished up last week, he mentioned, who's your master? And the very opening line here probably actually belongs with chapter 3. But, you know, when, they're, when they were writing the scriptures, when they are putting in the identifications, the, what I call the addresses, you know, the references, when they are putting those in, there, sometimes there would be a, the donkey would hit a chuck hole and there would be a bump and the guy would put the, put the period in the wrong spot. So in this case, that probably belongs with, the, with chapter 3. But for us today, uh, if, if I am accountable to God in heaven for my life, it's going to change the way I operate. It's going to change the way I live. You know, this tragedy that took place in Texas, in some ways, the chaos that we're experiencing in our, in our country is because we've removed this accountability element towards God. Even in old cowboy westerns and stuff, you would hear the guys talk about the, the accountability that they were going to have one day. You know, the gunslinger kill, killed, you know, 20 guys, but at the end of his life, when he got his, he would there would be a moment where he would reach out to God. He, he wasn't a Christian man. He didn't live a Christian life. He didn't know God in an intimate way like we talk about in salvation. But yet there was this, in, this, this knowing that they belonged to God. 
that ultimately they were going to stand before a creator and give an account for their life. And Paul is drawing from this as he concludes his letter now. And this idea of having a responsibility, accountability to someone is huge. If, uh, if you are using a Bible, you could flip back to Romans chapter 14 real quick. And my, I, was trying to, I was trying to put some notes together for pastor to put on the screen for you. I don't know if they're there or not. I'm not even going to look. <laughs> If it wasn't for Susan, I'd have never got them to him. <laughs> uh, you guys know how electronically challenged I am. If there's anything that happens behind me, it's because of somebody else's good work, not because of me. <laughs> but there's a, a few verses here in uh, Romans 14 that I just want to cover for a second, uh, starting at verse 10 here, if I can find it. There we are. Oh, that's not Romans. I was going, that doesn't make sense. The other Romans, yeah. I should have had these marked, huh? Oh, well. You know, if you're new here today, I'm sorry. I, I, I always tell everybody, I'm like the crazy uncle in the family that, you know, that steps up and says stuff to, uh, that people uh, think, wonder, where is that guy coming from? So we have, uh, so in Romans starting in verse 10, about the middle of the way down, it says, Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will uh, give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. So there's... We're in this tragic place in the body of Christ today. Now, I think it's a tragedy. Uh, you might have different feelings about it, but uh, there's whole ministries that uh, their whole purpose is to downgrade and beat up other ministries. And my feeling is, is you know, there, there's so much positive that could be expressed and worked at and uh, there's so many good things that we should be doing, and there's so many good things that should be happening in our lives. And why would we take all the time and energy and expense and, and, and just to run other people down, just to run other ministries down? Right here, we're going to give an account to God. Everyone's going to have to give an account to God. I give an account to God. You're going to give an account to God. Joel Osteen's going to give an account to God. I, I'm not responsible for what other people are doing. I'm only responsible for me. And if I will stand before God and allow his influence and his impact and, and, and his nature to permeate my being and, and challenge my mind and open the scriptures to me, then I'm accountable to him and I'm not responsible for you. Right? So I like to, uh, I like to remind people about the 20-40-60 rule. Have you guys heard the 20-40-60 rule? In your 20s, you're worried about what everybody thinks. In your 40s, you don't care what anybody thinks. When you're in your 60s, you realize nobody was thinking about you. Because <laughs> you really don't matter that much. We're full of ourselves. We're, we're busy about our own stuff. And, and the scripture admonishes us, be considerate of others. Spend some time looking at the one anothering scriptures. That's what God's called us to, is the one anothering. So today, what I want to remind us is that there's a, on the, at the cross, there is the vertical post that points to God, right? That's my relationship with God. That's, that's the part of my life where I can be cruising in the in the forest, I can be out on the golf course, I can be sitting in a boat throwing a line in the water. I, I can have intimacy and fellowship with God. That's the vertical part. But the horizontal part is the part where the hands were pinned to the cross of Christ. That's our, that's you and I, that's our place of reaching out to one another. I have a 
I have a relationship with Christ, but that should inspire me to reach out to you. That should inspire me to pray for you, to love you, to, to, to get to know you. And I, I get it. I, I'm not very good at that. I love that we come in here. I, I love the fellowship that we had yesterday. What a, what a great day that was. Thank you, Judy and Rosie and Deanna and anybody else that was involved. If you don't know, the gang threw us a reception and Susan and I felt so loved and so blessed. I, I counted a privilege to be part of this fellowship. Thank you for doing that for us. That's a reaching out. That's the connecting in the horizontal. And it's imperative that we learn how to do this. Most of us don't do it very well. And I get it. You know, we're busy. We have busy lives. We have jobs. We have our own intimate fam families. You know, our, our, our connections are right here, right around us. And I get that. Sometimes in life, that's all we can manage, right? But God calls us also to reach out to one another. And whatever that means for you, at least, at the very least, in prayer. And that's what Paul moves into here. He, he says to devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Being sober-minded, being aware of my shortcomings, being aware of our failings, that we fall short of what God has called us to, and that's okay. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to feel like you don't have enough room in your life for another person. I get that. But let's go to the Lord and say, God, expand me. Increase my capacity to love well. Increase my ability to reach out to someone. And if you will train yourself, discipline ourselves, if we will do this in our vertical because we all do that, right? I mean, I hope so. I hope that every one of you that belong to Jesus find time in your day or in your week to work on, to, to connect vertically with God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one. You know, Paul says to pray without ceasing. I don't think that means every chance, you know, get on your knees and fold your hands and, you know, wait on God. Those are great moments, great times. But that pray without ceasing is the ability to include God in every part of my life, everything that's going on, every place I fall short, every place that I need to encourage someone or, or be encouraged. We have divine opportunities pass by us all the time, and maybe we don't, aren't able to step into that moment because we haven't learned how to pray without ceasing. We're not in constant communion with the Lord. He's given us the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not a ritual. It's not a religious activity. It's an opportunity to have my best friend close to me on a regular basis so that when I'm sitting in uh, at a red light or somebody cuts me off or I'm waiting in line at the DMV, I'm, I'm, per, I'm, I'm perusing the place. I'm looking for opportunities to pray for people to love folks, to say, God, bless that person. When that person cuts me off and is driving like a maniac, God, I don't know what's going on in their life. God, I, I, I lift that person up to you, Lord. Bless them. Maybe there's a family crisis. Maybe there's a tragedy happening in their life. Maybe they're, maybe they're on drugs. I don't know what their situation is, but God, bless them. Minister to them right in this moment, God. Because God is able to go places you and I can't go. You know, many of us have kids that don't walk with Christ. We brought them to church. We taught them Sunday school. We told them Bible stories when they were young. But they don't walk with Jesus now. But those seeds that you sowed into their life, when they lay their head on the pillow at night, when they are in their alone moment, God reaches in and reminds them, that he was there when that 
hard thing happened, when that disappointment took place, when life didn't go the way that they thought it would, when they left their family ties and left their, their, uh, their, their moorings in, of the church, when they left those things thinking there was something else out there because the enemy is throwing sparkly stuff in front of everybody all the time trying to draw us away from the goodness of God, deceiving us into thinking that there's something in the world that I'm missing out on, and the church is full of these old fuddy-duddies. So I'm going go to I'm gonna go chase after that shiny thing because that's going to make me feel good. That's going to bring me pleasure. That's gonna, i, I got to get this all figured out because my friends are saying how awesome this is, so i got to go check this out. But when they lay their head on the pillow at night, it's them and God. And the Holy Spirit will honor your prayers. The Holy Spirit will remind that child, you belong to me. You're chasing your tail. You're living in sin. You're letting the enemy take advantage of you. But God's grace is there and available. His mercies are new every morning. When that sun comes up, it's a victory celebration. It's the, it's the mercies of God coming on to a lost world. That, that ball of fire is a picture of the goodness of God every morning. It's his promise to us as, a human, as humanity. As a, as a people group that as a whole, the billions of us have rejected him. We don't have time for him. You know, when you think about the few that sit in a church on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Friday night, it's, a, it's really a blip. And then amongst those, how many are really honoring God with their lives? How many know that they're accountable to a master in heaven. And they're letting him impact and influence their lives. Sober-minded, devoted to prayer, alert mind, and a thankful heart. There's a thankfulness that we're to have when we approach the throne room of God. I'm a sinner saved by grace by the grace of God. And it wasn't even my faith that reached out. It was his faith imparted to me that gave me the ability to say yes to him. You and I would go our own way given that chance. But God himself captured our heart. He captured our imagination. He came low and drew you into his presence. He revealed himself to you. And if you haven't had that experience yet, I pray that that would happen for you even this morning. That, go, that the reality of Christ would so fill your mind and your heart and your life that even now you would sense his presence. You would sense his coming close. That he's drawing you unto himself because he loves you. He created you so that he could pour his grace on you. He didn't create you for himself. He created you for relationship. So that he had an object to pour love onto. We are the benefactors of God's mercy. We are the ones that are blessed because of him. He's not cracking a whip on you and saying, you got to get this right. You got to do all of this stuff. You got to take care of business. And if you mess it up, then I'm kicking you to the curb. You don't belong here. That's not the heart of our God. The heart of our father is that he would pin himself to a cross and bleed out and release his spirit back into the father's heart so that you and I had opportunity to walk into his throne room and experience his grace, experience his goodness, 
experience his mercy in a deep, intimate way. That's our God. And so as we move on through our text, we see this man, Epaphras. He says, a member of your own fellowship. You know, uh, earlier this in, in this series, Pastor talked about how Paul never knew the Colossian church. He never went there. He didn't know those people, but he knew Epaphras. Epaphras was probably in prison with Paul when he's writing this. He was a, a faithful worker with Paul. And Epaphras could have possibly even been the pastor of the church in Colossae. In Acts, it tells us that he was the one that ministered the word of God to the Colossian church, to those that became the Colossian church. It's very possible that he was the missionary evangelist that started this church, and he brought this message to Paul as he was bound in prison. But Epaphras had a deep empathy, a deep love and compassion for his community. So he goes on here, he says, uh, 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 part of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus, he sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Aeropolis. He prays earnestly. He's committed to prayer, not because he has to. He, does, he probably does. They didn't have alarm clocks. So he did. He didn't. It wasn't a discipline in the sense that he set his alarm for four o'clock in the morning so that he could get up. No, he it was just part of him. His love for those people that embraced Christ, that heard his message, that took that message in. You, your and my opportunity is to pray for one another, is to go before God. He's the one that can make the difference. Yeah, I love that we're doing snow cones. I love that we have stuff to do. You know, the, the tailgate party and cornhole tournament and all the stuff that's going on. The party yesterday, all of it, all these opportunities to connect. Those are all awesome. But in my vertical, that's an opportunity for me to go before the Lord. And if you'll learn how to do this, if you'll press into God, he'll pass people in front of your mind. You know, so oftentimes we hear words, you know, God will speak, he'll say a word, but most of the time he speaks to us in pictures. So a face will pop into your mind. And if we're not paying attention, we could go, oh, yeah, I was thinking about so-and-so this week. Did you pray for him? Because if you belong to Christ, that's probably God speaking to you. Pray for this person. Pray for that person. Pray for pastor. Pray for the what's going on in church. This pray without ceasing. Every opportunity that we have, whatever's going on, any time of the day, any moment, because you belong to Christ. He's my master. And when my master calls, I obey. Right? He's not, he's not a taskmaster cracking a whip. He's a master full of grace and love. I'm a bond servant. I've taken the mark of Christ. They've pier he's pierced me with his love. He's pierced me with his mercy. And I've said yes to him. I'll follow you. I'll do what you ask. I'll go where you say. Yes, Hopefully, you're in that same place with him where you're ready to serve at a moment's notice when he calls. So we have Epaphras here. And then the next part, he prays earnestly, and he also uh, prays for your strength and that you'd be perfect, that, there, that you'd be strong enough to withstand the attacks of the enemy, that you'll recognize that even in our weakness, he is made strong, that I'm turning my focus and my attention to the strength of God 
when there's weakness, when there's disappointment, when there's discouragement, when there's stuff going on in my life that I don't know how to handle. That's the moment that I move towards God because the strength comes. The edification comes. It happens. And then that we're perfected, matured, that we grow up in Christ. I don't get my feelers hurt when pastor doesn't call me when I'm sick or in the hospital. When I come in the door and everybody doesn't celebrate that I'm here today. I don't get my feelers hurt. I, I, I'm mature in Christ. I recognize that God's called me to serve and to be a part and to help. So I, I'm not getting, not getting hurt. I'm not getting offended. I, I refuse to take offense. If something hurts my feelings, I lay it down. I lay it before the Lord. I let it go. In your relationships, in your marriages, with your kids, at work, there's so many opportunities for us to be offended. Isn't that what Jesus said? You're going to be offended in this world. It's going to happen. What do you do with it? You lay it down. You choose to be a person that won't take offense. That's a choice that we make to grow up in Christ. Amen? So these are the things that he's praying for, for his community and for those around him. And then to be fully confident, to have absolute assurance that I belong to Christ. See, I'm not wondering about whether I'm going to make it. You know, when my friend says, well, I'm not a very good person. I don't know if I'm going to make it into heaven. It's like, you don't get there because you're a good person. <laughs> you, you get there because you've hitched your wagon to the one that is truly good. The salvation that God offers comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. It's his work. It's not mine. It's not our work. We could pack this place out. We could have 10 services a weekend. We could have revival and line them up and push them down. We could have all kinds of stuff going on and God not be in the house. I want the reality of Christ. I want Jesus to be right here all the time. And that when I look in your face, I see him in you and you see him in me. The authenticity, the reality of who he is so fills our hearts and our minds that people can't stand it out there. they got to come check this out. When pastor's giving away snow cones, when we're st out in the parking lot playing cornhole, they're going, people are driving by going, what is going on over there? Because the joy of the Lord is so filling our lives. We're so filled with the Holy Spirit that the reality of Christ is a part of everything that we're doing. Because I'm plugged in vertically, but I'm reaching out horizontally. Because I'm letting the Spirit of God affect, impact what I do. What I do and how I speak. You know, he says here earlier, I passed it up, uh, verse, oh, extra eyes, sorry. Uh, verse 6, he talks about conversation. In, uh, in my King James, it says speech. You know, pastor likes to do sermon illustrations, uh, and if I was more of an electronics guy, I'd have taken a picture of this thumb for you so you could see it on the screen. I don't know if you can see this thumb, probably not, but... This one's normal looking. This is the one that holds the nail. <laughs> you swing that hammer. If you don't hit the nail, what do you hit? Yeah. You're supposed to let go of that thing, right? When the hammer comes down, I totally missed the nail. Didn't let go of it. And now I have the mark of my... Uh, my misfortune. So this is my sermon. Huh? 
Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is my sermon illustration. Is this thumb right here. And it reminded me of a story of a preacher that was home at his house building his gazebo during the week. And the neighbors knew he was a pastor, but they had never gone to his church. And they had an eight-year-old little boy that would come over while the pastor was building this gazebo in his backyard. He would come over, just sit on his bicycle, and just watch. He's about eight years old. He just watched the guy work on this. And finally, about the third day, the pastor says, uh, uh, Junior, so why, why are you coming over every day just to watch me work on this gazebo? He says, I want to see what a preacher says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> Because whatever's in there is what's going to come out. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The stuff that I'm thinking about, the stuff that I'm meditating on, the stuff that's going on inside of me, inside my brain, that's the stuff that leaks out when we aren't paying attention. You know, Jesus said we're going to give an account for every idle word we speak. You know, those are the words that we say when we're not thinking about it, you know? For, for my friends that use a lot of profanity, man, it's amazing how quick they can clean that up when their mom comes around or the kids come around or somebody, you know, somebody comes around that they think uh, it's going to offend and they'll clean that language right up. It's amazing. But if it's not in there, then it's not going to come out. And honestly, I don't remember what I said. I think it was more like, mm, that's going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and it did, and it has, and, you know, and I feel the ache of my stupidity every day for at least a few more days, right? Because the reality is, is that pain teaches us. Pain has impact on us. And God allows pain in this life to teach us, to grow us up. When stuff happens, when... Somebody challenges you when I have opportunity to be offended, when I get my feelers hurt, that's a chance for me to grow up, to reach out to God and say, God, help me with this. Help me, Lord. My thumb is hurting. Help me, Lord. I don't know where we're at. I'm sorry about whoever's doing the thing behind me I'm sorry my son told me just send whatever you want to Taylor because you're not going to follow it anyways <laughs> so I hope you're getting some of this I, I want to mention these names though uh, I spent some time on Epaphras uh, one of the things I also wanted to bring our attention to is that uh, Epaphras this uh, um, Laodicea, Oropolis and Colossae are these three little towns in on the um, uh, East end of Turkey, uh, Asia in your in your uh, Bible map, and they're they're a cluster of towns in this Lycus Valley, and it's just reminds me of the Rogue Valley. You know, we have Ashland, Talent, Phoenix, Medford, Central Point. Did I leave anybody out? I'm just I'm I just mean this this strip right along I five. This this is our valley. This is our Lycus Valley. Epaphras is pleading with God for revival, for uh, for for growth in the people that he loves and cares about. This is a picture of our opportunity to pray for those that are on this I five corridor between you know Gold Hill and Ashland. Yes, we want to pray for the world. Yes, we want to pray for folks in Texas. Yeah, we want to pray for folks in Ukraine. We want to pray for all the things that are going on in the world. But the, but the, the real earnest prayer of my heart is that God would send revival to the Rogue Valley. Not to raise up Path Church, but to see souls saved to see people come to know Christ, to see this place not have a reputation of drugs and trafficking, but a reputation of the glory of God and the goodness of God. That's what I want to see in our community. And if we can be a catalyst for that, awesome. Let it be so, God. 
use our young pastoral team to facilitate a revival that will shake the foundations of our valley for your glory. That's my hope and prayer. That's my desire. But I want to mention real quick these, these, these other people. We have Tychicus, who probably carried the letter. We have Onesimus, that is the slave of Philemon. If you read the book of Philemon, it's all about Onesimus. Paul pleading with Philemon to take to receive back this runaway slave. And those are all harsh terms in our culture today. I get it. But that was this is Bible times. This is a they're operating under a different set of rules. And God's not ordaining the rules. He's giving them opportunity to operate grace within the rules that they live under. Same as us. We have rules we don't like. We have laws we don't like. We have stuff going on in our country that we don't like. But we, by the grace of God, we operate within those rules, looking for his opportunity, looking for that opportunity for God to do a mighty work, a miraculous work. We have Aristarchus, who traveled with Paul in his uh, third missionary trip. Uh, we have Mark. Uh, if you remember, Mark was uh, Paul didn't like Mark. There was, a, there was a season where they separated, and it even caused a rift between Paul and Barnabas. They were a team, but because of John Mark's immaturity, Paul said, I don't want anything to do with that guy. He left us high and dry. So I, I don't want him on my team. He's, he's not trustworthy. But later on, Mark is very trustworthy. He becomes a young man that Paul adores and loves and, and actually sends places to pastor and do ministry. And Mark became a, uh, an amazing apostle in his own right. We have Jesus who's called Justice. And these three uh, are the only Jews in the group. The rest are Gentiles. The rest are followers of Christ, but not through Judaism, through the ministry of Paul. We have Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, the doctor. We have Nympha, who was a, the hostess of the church there, and Archippus, who was probably the son of Philemon. If you read Philemon, you see Archippus is, uh, 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 is recognized there, acknowledged. He's probably uh, the pastor there, and Paul is admonishing him here at the end of his letter in verse 17 he says say to Archippus be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you and that could be a word to you and I what is the ministry that the Lord has given you see if God is my master what is my ministry I've told you before I, I thought my ministry was going to look like Jimmy Swaggart you know, I bought the shoes and the three-piece suit and the slick back haircut. I had it all, man. I was happening. I was a happening thing at 22. <laughs> Line them up and push them down, man. That was going to be my deal. Going to see him healed and filled with the Spirit and raised up. I got the tears part down. But all the rest of it, I would just fumble around and not get it right and couldn't figure it out and... And all the time it was God saying, you know, I don't need another Jimmy Swaggart. I got one of those. I need a Steve Carr. I need a guy that will go to work every day and take care of his family and serve me with all his heart as a regular guy. A guy that's not afraid to stand up in front of people and be vulnerable and open and candid. And You're not going to be a super saint. You're just you. So quit your fussing and just serve me every day. And I got opportunities to do that. I'm, I'm a ditch digger. That's what I do. And I've been in lots of holes with lots of people and had lots of opportunities to talk to them about Jesus in a hole, standing over a sewage pit, talking about Jesus. Because it's amazing when you're real, when you're vulnerable, when you're open. People will say, you know, what makes you tick, man? You are weird. <laughs> I, play, I played softball with a group of guys that most people wouldn't let near their children. 
honestly. We, they were called the Jokers, named after the biker gang, which we're not supposed to tell anybody because they would come kill us. But the, you know, we had a reputation of, you know, I was the designated driver. And I would do a thing I called softball church, where if at the softball tournament, if we made it to Sunday, of course, they're all drunk and hungover and, you know, it's fortunate they didn't, they didn't go to jail, so we'd have a complete team on Sunday morning. But Sunday morning, we would do church on the mound, called it softball church. And I would talk to them about the grace of God and the mercy of God. And they would stand there and they would listen because I didn't talk down to them. I talked across to them because I'm not a super saint. I'm not looking for their money. I don't need their following. I don't need their praise. I don't need their, I don't need any of that. They need what I have. And the people in your life, they need what you have. You have a secret inside you. you there is a mystery inside you aching to get out. And God will present opportunities for us to leak his goodness. If we'll fill up with him, he'll leak out every day of your life, every opportunity that you have. I love this passage that we're looking at today. Because it mentions these people by name. Paul wasn't a man, one man show. We like to think of Paul. Paul was an amazing theologian. A powerful preacher. Powerful person of faith. Left for dead. Shipwrecked. Stoned. Beaten with rods and with whips. In prison. In prison. In prison. In prison. Because he would stand in a courtyard and declare the goodness of God. When everyone else was serving idols and the religious, the, the Jewish religious people were not honoring God with their lives. They were pushing rules and saying, follow these rules. Paul comes on the scene and says, you know. I was a rule follower, but I found out that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He knocked me flat on, the, on my face. He blinded me for days, and then he restored my sight. He set me free from religion, from bondage, from, from myself, and people hated him for it. Everyone, except for those that had hearts that were open to the grace of God. I hope that's you today. I hope that's us today. You know, Paul finishes up this letter in verse 18. He says, here is my greeting in my own handwriting. The authenticity of Paul here is incredible to me. He could, have, he could have signed his letter, uh, you know, once a Pharisee, once a, a follower of Judeo religion, once a, a great orator, once this powerful anointed preacher. He wasn't a super saint. That wasn't how he saw himself. That's how we might see him or somebody might get the idea that that's what he thinks about himself. But it's not what he thinks about himself. Listen to how he finishes this letter. He says, remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. That's it. No. No, sign up for my subscription so that you can receive my mailings and see my TV show and know all about my ministry and 
we're going to be in this town and that town and this town and that town and we're going to show up with my entourage of prophets and healers and we're going to stand before you and we're going to be this powerful ministry team that's going to take care of all your ailments. No, he says, grace, grace be with you. Remember my chains because I'm in prison and it makes it hard to preach with chains on. I do it. My audience of two or ten. But remember my train, my chains and mostly grace, the grace of God be with you. Amen. John, if you'd come and prepare, I have asked John to lead us today, kind of a closing benediction. And I, I don't know where you're at today in your process, in your journey with Christ. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you struggle reaching across, you know, reaching out to someone. Maybe you're horizontal, lax. Maybe you're vertical, isn't where it needs to be. If your vertical isn't where it needs to be, you're going to really struggle with the horizontal. People are going to hurt your feelings. You're not going to like them because most of us are messed up. I know I stand before you and tell you I'm messed up, but you sitting out there, you're messed up too. (laughs) But I tell you, God is so good. This is our opportunity. This is our moment. If I've said anything that has touched you in any way, shape, or form, this is your moment. Reach out vertically and let the goodness of God enter in a deep, compassionate way. Have empathy and then look for his call with the horizontal. Amen.